This Parsha podcast is dedicated in the merit of the more than 200 hostages currently being held by the murderous terrorists in Gaza. We pray for their safety. We pray for their health. We pray for their swift return to their families and their homes. Earlier today, I was watching Israeli television online, and I heard something really beautiful and powerful. One of the panelists was saying that on Shabbos, he was in shul in Jerusalem. And when they read from the Torah, of course, they offer the Mishaberach, the blessing. And they insisted to mention all the names, more than 200 names of all their, of all the hostages, the names of the hostages themselves and their mothers. And I thought this was a very beautiful gesture. You know, which you get a bit calloused. There's so many people that were hurt, so many people that government were killed, so many people that were taken captive. And it becomes almost not a story of individuals, but just this, this big glob of pain and tragedy. And I think it's a powerful statement to remember that these are all our brothers and sisters, and each one of them is, is precious. Each soul is worth the entire world. If it was just one, we should turn over the entire world to get them back. And now that there are so many, we have to realize it's really, each one is its a tragedy on its own. And of course, we hope and we pray that they return safely and speedily and we hear only good news from our brethren in Israel. In this Parsha podcast, we will have, please God, three segments. This is year eight of the Parsha podcast, and I'm really enjoying it in the past couple of years, I think it's been five, six years that we have a new theme each year. But this year it's dad, which is like deep and deeper to try to go a bit behind the scenes, beneath the subtext, the substrate of the Parsha. And I'm liking it so much. I I don't know. I don't know if I could come up with another theme next year that will top the one of this year. It's so wonderful. It's so delightful. And it's so enjoyable. And I I will tell you that the last segment that we're going to cover today, please God, It's an idea that's been in my notes for more than a year. I've been saving it for today, for this Parsha podcast, Parsha's Chayi Sarah, year eight of the Parsha podcast. It's so delightful. It's so deep. It's so wonderful. I'm excited to share. But let's begin with a warm-up, a warm-up segment. There's a wonderful and mystifying Midrash at the very beginning of our Parsha. Of course, the Parsha starts off with the death of Sarah. Sarah gets the news that Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac. It wasn't presented to her in a way that she could be calmed, that he's okay. And she dies. And she dies at the age of 127. That number appears only one other place in Scripture. In the beginning of the book of Esther, of course, that tells the Purim story. It tells us that King Ahasuerus, who would go on to marry Esther, he ruled over 127 countries. So to us, this is totally random. You know, 127, the age of Sarah when she died. 127, the number of countries that Ahasuerus, soon to marry Esther, ruled over. To us, it's totally random, totally coincidental. The Midrash says something amazing. And then the context of the Midrash is also kind of interesting. It tells us that the great Rabbi Akiva, he was giving a lecture. And the crowd was getting a bit sleepy. And they were starting to nod off. Think about this. This is the lecture of the great Rabbi Akiva. Really, all of our Torah Shabbat, the, the oral Torah really comes via Rabbi Akiva and his students. And he's giving a lecture. What would we not give up to once participate in Rabbi Akiva's lecture? Of course, the Talmud tells us that Moshe, 1400 years before Rabbi Akiva, he was able to witness prophetically the lecture of the great Rabbi Akiva. And he was so amazed and so wowed that he thought it would be fitting and appropriate that the Torah be given not via Moshe, but via Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, our sages tell us, he really serves as almost the Moshe of the oral Torah. And he's given a lecture, 
and people are nodding off. People are dozing off in the lecture. And he wants to jar them awake. He wants to awaken them. He wants to arouse them. He wants to pique their interest. So he says that Esther and her ruling over with her husband, Ahasuerus, over 127 countries, that is connected to Sarah, who lived 127 years. What does he say? Why was Esther meritorious to rule over 127 countries? Why is that fitting? Because Esther, she is the descendant of Sarah. And Sarah lived for 127 meritorious years. And in the merit of the 127 years of Sarah, her descendant, her great-great-great-granddaughter Esther, she ruled over 127 countries. Thus concludes this most interesting and mysterious Midrash. A lecture hall. The great Rabbi T was given a lecture. And the crowd is maybe snoozing. If you've ever spoken to a, to an audience in the past, you have a very keen sense of who's paying careful attention, who's listening intently, and who is spacing out. The audience doesn't know that the speaker could see exactly who's on their phone and who's chatting and who's really listening carefully and who's engaged. Rabbi Tiva senses that the, the audience is maybe they're, they're dozing off a bit. Now, to uh, their defense, the Talmud talks about the lectures of the great sages of that era. They would lecture so extensively. This was not the, you know, 45 minute lecture or even an hour or even three hours. The Talmud says that there were some lectures that were so interminable that the students who participated, all became infertile because they went so long without going to the bathroom that it ruined their capacity to reproduce. And obviously, that's a terrible thing. But it gives us a sense of the length of these lectures. Of course, the Talmud tells the great story of Hillel. Hillel, the elder, before he became very famous, he had to pay to go join the academy. And one day, he didn't make enough money from wood chopping to join the academy. So he climbed onto the roof and was listening to the lecture via the skylight the whole night. And in the morning, they noticed uh, the figure, the silhouette of Hillel. And he was almost dead and had to, had to revive him. So we know that, and this was Friday night, the Talmud also says. In the times of Hillel, that's a generation or two before Rabbi Akiva, the lectures we're on Friday night going through the entire night into the morning. These are not uh, quick one and dones, you know, quick sound bites. Four to five seconds to respond. It might have been a 16-hour lecture, maybe a 24-hour lecture. Who knows? So, you know, you could maybe hear how someone might nod off during this marathon. And Rabbi Tiva wants to shake them awake. How do you do that? How do you get the attention of an audience that has gone astray? You say something so outlandish, so strange, that by the, the sheer oddness of what you say, it gets their attention. And he connects the seemingly random 127s, the 127 of Sarah, the 127 of, of Esther, and that's the simple interpretation. But the Hasidic masters say something fabulous, something deep. The students were a bit tired, dozing off, snoozing, oh, yawning. When is this lecture going to finally end? We've all been there before. But they're studying Torah. And the best and highest and most powerful use of your time it's a study Torah. And Robert Kiva wanted to convey to them a message of how precious every second of doing a mitzvah of studying Torah is. And he says, if you were to look at Sarah, she lived 127, pretty long life, 127 years full of righteousness. And you wonder how valuable that is? If you were to filter that through the almighty system of reward and punishment, 
A fair reward for Sarah's 127 years of righteousness would be to rule over effectively the entire world, 127 countries. And you would imagine that every country that has provinces, it has regions, every region has cities, every city has neighborhoods, every neighborhood has streets. Sarah, in her righteousness, every year she did enough merits to be worthy of having an entire country. Well, if every year earns a country, maybe uh, every every minute gives you a, a small cul-de-sac, a small subdivision. That's how powerful it is. One second of Torah, it's worth the whole world. Every second is precious. Every moment is to be cherished. Every mitzvah unlocks worlds. Rabbi Kiva was telling them about the importance to not forfeit even a second of your life, even a smidgen of your potential. It's so powerful. We can say that the, the main difference between the super righteous and us simpletons, one of the main differences is the value that is accorded to opportunity, to time. The one thing that does not stale is time. And therefore, it's the most precious. No matter how much money you have, you can't buy any more of it. And with your time, you can unlock veritable worlds of reward. The Talmud says that every righteous person earns 310 olamos, worlds, that you are creating with your mitzvos. You study Torah. You perform a mitzvah. You're creating an angel. You're creating a spiritual world. And when you die, the world that you are transitioned to, that's the world that you created with your mitzvos. 127 years effectively mean 127 countries. That is the size of the spiritual world, so to speak, that Sarah created. And every second, it's so powerful. The opportunity is so great. Don't miss out on opportunity. Don't sleep. Don't snooze. Don't doze. He's pushing them. He's encouraging them to maximize their opportunities. One of the marks of the greats was the fastidious meticulousness that they accorded every moment. When the Chavetz Chaim was unable to account for five minutes of his year, he cried bitter tears because there was moments that he could not account for. Of course, that's way beyond us. Like this idea of of keeping track of every moment and every second, that's the mark of the greats. But in general, we have time. We have opportunity. Today, there's more downtime for modern society than there ever was. Your clothing gets dirty, you put it in a box and push a button. It's much easier. I've been reliably told (laughs) than washing it in the river. People have so much leisure time. The average American watches like, what, four hours of television a day? Now, since the war, I'm kind of guilty of it as well. Not quite four hours, but I I have this weakness. I got to watch the Israeli television to get a sense of what's actually happening. Leisure is great, but every moment is worth millions. And to waste time, it's a real tragedy. The great Rabbi Noah Weinberg used to say, he had this iconic line. He would say that if you're wasting time, it's suicide on an installment plan. 60 years, no AP, 0% APR. It's an installment plan for suicide, which is such a powerful framing. Your life, you have time, you have opportunity. It's not going to be forever. And we want to make the most of it. And we don't want to end it prematurely. And when the Almighty wants to take our soul, let him take our soul. But so long as we're here, let's make the most of our time. Wasting time, says Robin Weinberg, Suicide on an installment plan. What a valuable lesson. Yes, of course, 
There's the beautiful image of Rabbi Akiva and his students, and they're dozing off. We've been here for 20 hours. We've been here for 26 hours. We've been here for 36 hours. People are tired. People are cranky. People are hungry. You imagine that there's justification for people to get a little uh, a little tired. And Rabbi Akiva comes and says, with 127 years, you can earn 127 countries. That's the power of every, of every moment. And yes, it's hard. But if you realize what opportunities lie in every moment, it'll be a bit easier for you to make the most of your time. Segment number one, it's just the warm-up segment. We're getting warmed up. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Exercising my right to bear arms here in Houston, Texas. Let's go to segment number two. The beginning of the parsha. it talks about now that uh, Sarah has passed, Abraham is trying to purchase a burial spot for Sarah. And he has a very particular parcel of land, land and a cave that he wants. And our parsha really has a very lengthy negotiations between, between Abraham and the Hittites, and specifically Ephron the Hittite. And it seems to be told in very exhaustive length in the Torah. Now, just for clarity, the Hittites are one of the Canaanite nations, and the man who owned the cave that Abraham was desirous of, he was a Hittite, Ephron the Hittite. But in general, if you read the negotiations, the Hittites in general, the, the Bnei Ches, are featured very prominently in the negotiations. And the Midrash calculates that there are ten times in the Torah that it talks about the Bnei Ches, the Hittites. And all ten times that they're mentioned, it's in the context of this real estate transaction, where Abraham buys the cave of Machpelah, the cave of the patriarchs, from Ephraim the Hittite in front of the rest of the Beneches, the Hittites. In our parasha, chapter 23, verses 3 and 5 and 7 and 10 and 16 and 18 and 20, so that's eight times it says the word Beneches, Hittites, Towards the end of our parasha, chapter 25, verse 10, it revisits the cave of the patriarchs because that's when Abraham was buried there. And it again revisits this transaction and it again invokes the Hittites. And finally, at the end of Genesis, chapter 49, when discussing the burial location of Jacob, it again mentions that he's being buried in the land, in the field, in the cave that Abraham purchased from the Bnei Ches, from the Hittites. So it seems like there is an effort to really connect these people, the Hittites, the Bnei Ches, to the purchase of this property. And the Midrash says something really interesting. The Midrash notes that there's a lot of ink that has been spilled and a lot of broken quills to write again and again and again the Bnei Ches, the Hittites, the Hittites, the Hittites. Ten times in the Torah, it tells us about the Hittites. Says the Midrash, why does it talk about the Hittites ten times in the Torah? To teach you. Because they oversaw, they witnessed, they facilitated, they aided Abraham in his purchase of the field and of the cave that he wanted. And they witnessed the transaction and they attested to it. They helped the righteous, Abraham, to do this purchase we told about this 10 times, because their merits in helping Abraham are the equivalent of them upholding and adhering to the 10 commandments. 10 times in the Torah, it talks about the Hittites. 
and their role in helping Abraham. They helped the tzaddik. They helped the righteous. They helped Abraham. You help Abraham, I'm going to repeat it ten times in the Torah. And we'll have lots of ink spilled and lots of broken quills to write B'nei Ches, B'nei Ches, B'nei Ches again and again and again ten times. So everyone knows their role. It's not, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, the, they were the title company of a certain transaction. Oh, no. They are elevated, says the Midrash, to this level because they aided Abraham. They're elevated and it's as if they fulfilled the Ten Commandments. And that's why it says B'nei Ches ten times. If you think about B'nei Ches, it's five letters. Times ten, it's fifty letters in the Torah. There are entire books of Talmud that are based on fewer than fifty letters in the Torah. And you think about how many millions of Torah scrolls were written throughout history. How many tens of millions of letters, all that ink, all those broken quills, to just highlight the role of the Hittites. And why? Because they helped Abraham. And it says it ten times because helping Abraham is so powerful, it's so impactful. It's like they upheld the Ten Commandments. Now the Balaturim, in his comment to the beginning of our parsha, he adds another wrinkle to this idea. The Hittites are called the Bnei Ches or Bnei Ches in the Torah. The word Ches. It's actually the name of one of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, or Ches. Number eight. Says the uh, Palaturim, if you look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, how many times does this letter, the letter Chet for the Hittites, B'nei Ches. How many times does this letter appear in the Ten Commandments? Exactly ten times. Once for each instance that the Hittites are mentioned in the Torah. The Hittites, they help Abraham. And therefore ten times we revisit their role. And the Midrash tells us that's because their role is so important. It's as if they fulfilled the Ten Commandments. And their name is B'nei Ches which is the letter. And that letter appears ten times in the Ten Commandments, once for each instance that the Hittites are lauded for their role in helping facilitate this transaction in the Torah. This is something obviously very powerful and very deep and counterintuitive. If we were to look at this transaction happening between between Abraham and the Hittites, and specifically Ephraim the Hittite, None of us would think much about the role of the people there to help facilitate this transaction. They're very desirous of Abraham buying this property and never wants to help him. It's a nice thing. Our sages are telling us that to help Abraham, that's not just a nice thing. It's like you fulfill the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments that the Almighty gave our nation at Sinai, the, the bedrock, the foundation, the condensed digest of all of the will of Hashem, that's how powerful it is. And we'll repeat it ten times so you know. And we'll write the letter Ches in the Ten Commandments ten times so you know. These Hittites, they have eternal merit for helping Abraham. This to me is a very powerful insight. And the truth is, in many places, in the writings of our sages, we find this idea about how valuable it is, how powerful it is, to help the righteous, to help the Torah scholar. The Talmud, and I collected a few of these citations for you. The Talmud of the book of Brachos on page 10b tells us, if you host a Torah scholar in your home, and you made sure that they are benefiting from your possessions, it's as if you have brought a Tamid sacrifice. The Tamid sacrifice, which is the the most basic sacrifice brought in the temple every single day. That is the one sacrifice that's like the the prayer, the daily prayer featured in the temple. Today we cannot offer sacrifices, but you just host 
the righteous in your home. And you make sure they benefit from your things. That is equivalent, says the Talmud, Brachos 10b, to offering a sacrifice. Second citation in the Talmud from the book of Tsubas on page 111b. Someone who marries off their daughter to the righteous. Someone who does business with the righteous. Someone who made sure that the righteous benefit from their possessions. Someone like that. It's as if they are cleaving, so to speak, to the Almighty. Of course, we cannot cleave literally to God. But the verse tells us that we should cleave to the Almighty by helping those who represent God in the world in a variety of ways. You marry your daughter off to them. You do business with them. You make sure that they benefit from your possessions. It's as if you have fulfilled this idea of cleaving to God. Yoma 71a. You want to bring a sacrifice. You want to bring a wine libation. You can't do it today. We don't have a temple. If you fill the mouth of the righteous with wine, it's the same thing as pouring the wine upon the foundation of the altar in fulfillment of a wine libation. There's something very powerful about being there to aid, to assist, to contribute towards the agenda of a Torah scholar. You assist them in any way. That is very powerful. These Hittites, I I, didn't even notice it. It's like you read it, okay, the Hittites, the Hittites, again and again and again. And you count it 10 times in Genesis. The Hittites, just by helping Abraham, just by helping facilitate his desire to get this parcel of land, they earn eternal merit. And it's like they have fulfilled the Ten Commandments. Let us never underestimate the power of helping the righteous. And now for segment number three. This is what I've been saving from last year. If you read the narrative of Abraham's negotiations with the Hittites and Abraham's negotiations with Ephron the Hittite, it seems a bit uh, repetitive. So it tells us, of course, that Sarah died and Abraham eulogized her and cried over her. And then verse 3, Abraham wants to find a burial spot. And he approaches the Hittites. And he gives them a whole speech. I'm a sojourner here, or I could be a resident. Give me a place to bury my dead and let me bury my dead. And they respond, listen, you're our master, you're, you're a prince amongst us. Wherever you want to bury your dead, you can bury your dead. No one's going to withhold from you their land from burying your dead. And Abraham is very appreciative. And then again he responds, if you are desirous to help me bury my dead, listen to me and select Ephron. And let Ephron give me the Ma'arsa Machpelah, the Machpelah cave. I'll pay full money. I want to have this as a burial spot. And Ephron responds, says, no, I charge you money. No, 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 uh, let me give it to you for free so you should bury your dead. And Abraham's appreciative. But he says, no, 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 I want to pay. Take the money and let me bury my dead. And Ephron responds, okay, well, if that's what you want, 400 silver coins, that's uh, between me and you, what, what is it? Go bury your dead. And indeed, Abraham proceeds to give him the money and to bury Sarah. There's a transaction here. Abraham has his deceased wife that he wants to bury. And he wants to buy a burial spot, a specific one. Of course, the reason why Abraham wanted this specific spot, it's a very special spot, as we shall see. We've talked about this in the past. But why does he want to purchase this? We know, because he wants to bury Sarah there. If you read the narrative, it mentions again and again and again the fact that Abraham wants to bury his dead there. And that's the nature, that's the objective of this transaction. In verse 4, Abraham says, Ve'ekbera may see, let me bury my dead. In verse 6, it says twice, 
They respond, Kvores Mesecha, bury your dead. And no one will stop you from Mikvor Mesecha, from burying your dead. And then in verse 8, Likvor es Mesi, I want to bury my dead. And then in verse 11, Kvor Mesecha, bury your dead. And then in verse 13, Ve'ekbar es Mesi, I will bury my dead. And then again in verse 15, Ve'es Mesecha, Kvor, and you're dead. You should bury. It seems a bit redundant. Certainly, if we were writing this, we would be a bit more brief in the words that we use. He could have shaved off a few instances of repeating, <laughs> Abraham was a bury dead, bury dead, bury dead, bury dead, take the dead and bury them. And of course, the Torah never says anything extraneous. So why is it belaboring this point? Why is it repeating it again and again that the objective of this purchase is to bury Abraham's dead? Question number one. Question number two, if you examine the seven instances where it repeats that the objective of this purchase is to bury the dead, in six of them, it says the word bury before the word dead. The first six, Abram says, Ve'ekbara, let me bury, may see my dead. Kivar es mesecha, bury your dead. Mitvar mesecha, from burying your dead. So the word bury comes before dead. Verse 8, Likbar es mesi, to bury my dead. Verse 11, Kvar mesecha, bury your dead. Verse 13, Ve'ekbara, let me bury es mesi, my dead. The first six, you'll notice, it has the word bury before the word dead. And then in verse 15, it suddenly switches. Ve'es mescha, and you're dead, kivar, bury. So why is there a change? The first six time it says bury, the word bury first, kvar, and then the word dead, meis, mesecha. And then the last time, the seventh of seven times that it mentions that the objective of this transaction is to bury the dead, it says ve'es mescha, kvar, it says the word dead, and only then, does it say bury? And of course, the question is why? It should have been consistent, you would have imagined, throughout. The Gona Vilna has a masterful insight. How many people were buried in this cave? So of course we know Adam and Eve were already buried there. And the Midrash tells us, how did they end up there in particular? Because after they were kicked out of the garden, they spent a lot of time trying to find their way back in. They couldn't take the direct path because there was the flaming, swirling sword and the cherubs protecting the way, the path, the derech, the way of the tree of life. So they spent years trying to find another way in. And Adam chanced upon a cave. And the cave bared the distinctive aroma of the garden. And he started digging to try to find a portal to get back in. And he dug until he heard a voice. The voice, the heavenly voice, the prophetic voice said to him, Stop! You may dig no longer. If this Midrash sounds familiar, I did cite it at the very beginning, the introduction of my book, not the one I'm writing now, but the one that I wrote and published last year upon a ten-stringed harp. Adam had found one of the portals, one of the entrances back into the garden. And when he got close, he was stopped. But he remembered this cave. And when Eve died, he buried her there. And when he died, his son Seth buried him in the same cave. And Abraham also chanced upon this cave. The Midrash tells us that when the three guests came to visit it, visit him, they were really angels masquerading as guests. The verse says, Ve'el ha-bakar ratz Avraham. Abraham ran after the bakar, so the Midrash tells us the word Bakar is the same letters as Kever, which means a, a gravesite. Abraham chased the cow all the way to the gravesite. 
and he walks into the cave and he sees the candle is lit and he sees Adam and Eve there. Now, mind you, no one else could see that. Only Abraham, who had the spiritual vision, he knew how special this place was. Ephron and the rest of the Hittites, they saw nothing remarkable about this cave. But Abraham wanted this cave in particular, and that's why he wanted it. And he goes to Ephron and the Hittites, and he says, I want to buy this cave. And indeed, the transaction was consummated. How many people were subsequently buried in this cave? So Sarah was buried here. Abraham is buried here. Later on in the Torah, we read about how Rebekah and Isaac were buried. So that's Sarah's one, Abraham's two, Rebekah's three, Isaac is four, Leah is five, Jacob is six. Of course, Rachel was not buried there. She was buried in Bethlehem on the way back entering the land. But there was actually a seventh person who was buried there, sort of. The Talmud tells us that when Jacob was being buried, and they went with this whole long procession from Egypt to bury Jacob, they arrived at the cave and there was someone there blockading the entrance to the cave, Asaph. And Asaph said, there's only one more place here to be buried, and it's mine, because you already buried your wife there. And Jacob's descendants protested, wait, wait a minute, Jacob bought that spot from you. He made a big pile of all his gold and all his silver, all the money that he earned outside the land of Israel, and he gave it to you in exchange for your spot. And he says, I don't remember that. Where's the documentation? Documentation, we left it in Egypt. So they quickly dispatched Naphtali to go back to Egypt. He was the fastest one. Go back and reclaim it. Meanwhile, everyone's milling about. Everyone's waiting for something to happen because they cannot bury Jacob because Asaph is stopping them. One of the people that was there is the deaf grandson of Jacob, Chushim, the son of Don, of Dan. And he was a little out of it because he's deaf. And uh, he communicates with someone, what's going on? Why aren't they burying Jacob? It's a great disgrace to the dead that he's just being held in limbo. So they communicated to him. Maybe they used hand motions. Oh, that, that man, that burly, hairy, redhead, ruddy man. Uncle Asaph, he's stopping it. He's stopping it. He grabs a sword, runs over to Asaph, slices off his head, decapitates him, and they bury Jacob. What happened to Asaph's head? It rolled into the cave, we're told. And Asaph was also buried in the cave, not his whole body, only his head. And in the past, we've mentioned that that, that tells us that Asaph, he was really worthy of being buried alongside the other patriarchs. But only if you look at his head. If you look at the rest of the body, it didn't really filter down to the rest of the body. But there were seven people that were ultimately buried. Again, six. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Leah, and the head of Asaph. Our narrative is talking about the purchase of this burial spot. And seven times it says, again and again and again, that the purpose of this purchase was for burying the dead. Why? Because there are seven people destined to be buried there. And with the first six, they were all righteous. And therefore, it says the word bury before the word dead. And the last one refers to Ace of the Wicked. For him, the proper order is dead and then buried. Says the Gona Vilna, he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says that the righteous, when they are dead, they are still alive. They're deemed alive. The wicked, even when they're alive, they're deemed dead. 
So Asaph, he was wicked. Even in his lifetime, he was deemed dead. So for him, he was dead long before he even died. He, he's been dead for a long time. He's dead first, and then they bury him. The righteous, even after they die, they're alive. So they're actually buried before they die. Because they're alive, the soul is still alive. And therefore, the way the Torah views them, they're still alive. And they're being buried. So they're all, oh, the, the word bury, the word kavar, must precede the word for, for death. They're not dead. They're alive. And yes, they're being buried. They're being buried first. And then, and then, and then there's the word dead. The righteous, when they're dead, they're alive. And that's why the word bury appears before the word dead. You know, even the righteous, even the righteous will die. A second before the resurrection, the Talmud tells us, a moment, a smidgen before the resurrection, the righteous die and right away are brought back alive. There is a benefit of dying. It helps cleanse a person of the sin of Adam. Once Adam sinned, death is beneficial for humanity. And that's why Adam was not allowed to eat from the tree of life. Because then he'll never die and therefore he'll never be cleansed from the contaminants and the toxins that are in his body as a result of the sin. So even the righteous will benefit from dying. But they're not dead yet. They're alive now. Yes, they're buried. (laughs) They're buried. And they will die in the future a second before the resurrection, the Talmud tells us. A moment before, just to glean the benefits of death, and right away they will be brought back to life. And therefore, it says seven times the objective of this purchase, the first six, for the first six people to be buried there, the righteous ones, it says the word bury before dead. The last one, Asaph, he's been long dead, way before he's buried. And that's why the proper order and your dead one, i.e. Asaph, who will be, will be dead before he's buried, for him, it is proper to have the word dead before the word bury. I love this piece. Of course, there's a lot of powerful lessons here. But I love it because it's a sophisticated way of reading the parsha. We just assume, oh, it talks about all the Hittites, and it just says Hittites, Hittites, Hittites again and again. Oh, and it happens to be repeating again and again and again the fact that the objective of this purchase is for the burial of the dead. And the commentaries, they bring us a little bit uh, beneath the surface, behind the veneer, inside, inside the hidden inner sanctums of the Torah. And they reveal to us how every single letter, every single word is absolutely bursting with meaning and with value. I mentioned at the top of the podcast that one of the Israeli panelists, they went to shul and they, they did a mishaberach for every single, every single one of the hostages. Not just a general, you know, a, a general term, release the hostages. Every single one. I thought it would be fitting maybe that we mention their names as well here as a form of prayer and a form of dedication to help achieve their safety and their swift release with the help of the Almighty. I decided to wait to the end because most, most, many, I don't know, some people have a hard time listening to all of this. So if you're not interested in hearing me read the names or the names that I have, I found online a list of all the names or as many as we could have. I want to read the names, and we're going to dedicate our our study today in the merit of these people. Okay, let's begin. Um, Some of the names, we have the names of them and their parents, or the father or the mother. I'm just going to read what I have over here. I don't don't know. I don't know if this is updated, if it includes everyone. It's hundreds and hundreds of names. Let's begin. Okay, the first one is Agam Berger, and then Agam Batchen. 
Adar bat Daniela, Ehud ben Esther, Ehud ben Karen, Ophir ben Rishel, Ophir ben Sharon, Ophek ben Eti, Or ben Avi, Or ben Sima, Or El ben Merav, Ori bat Enav, Uriel bat Naami, Oria ben Hagar, Oria bat Chani, Osher ben Rachel, Iti ben Merit, Iti Chen, Noah bat Adi, Iti Regev, Etan Avraham ben Ephrat, Etan ben Matsheva, Etan ben Chadit, Ala ben Ma'ayan, bat Ma'ayan, Ala bat Ma'ayan, there's two of them apparently, Alon ben Idit, Elia, Eliyahu ben Odel, Elia ben Odiel, Elia ben Batsheva, Elia ben Sigal, Eliyahu ben Chana, Eliakim Shlomo ben Avishag, Eliasha ben Ludmila, Alex ben Otsena, Alma Or, Almog Meir ben Orit, El Ad ben Chana, El Kana ben Ruchama, Ama bat Sharon, Ama Konyo, Amelia bat Daniel, Amitai ben Chafsi, Erez ben Hadas, Ariel ben Shiri, Artor, Aaron ben Mina, Ben ben Zahava, Ben ben Nerit, Ben ben Sion ben Mazal, Ma'aya bat Gavriela, Ma'aya bat Karen Moti ben Mazal, Mor ben Linda, Maya bat Merit, Maya bat Karen, Michael ben Rachel, Mika bat Karina, Ma'ayan, Bat Racheli, Matan ben Miriam, Navo ben Merav, Naor ben Livnat, Nave ben Adi, Noya bat Galit, Noah bat Lea, Noah bat Liora, Noah bat Muli, Noah bat Nitsona, Noam ben Yonat, Anachman ben Dagnit, Nitsan ben Vered, Nitsan ben Yiska, Nitsan bat Ronit, Nik ben Katya, Noam Avigdori, Noam Or, Noam Batalia, Noam Ben Hadas, Noam Ben Sharon, Noam Liel Ben Roital, Naama Bat Eilat, Ayelet, Sa- uh, San, San Ben Sarah, Sohar Ben, Ta- ben Tamar, Sohar Bat Hadas, Stephen Ben Ira- Irina, Irina, Strutsta, I might be butchering that one. Sitrusta, Tomer ben Orli, Sigal bat Ani, Sigal bat Esther, Celine ben David, Stav bat Eti, Ada bat Esther, Adi ben ah- bat Ahuva, Adi bat Jacqueline, Adi bat Shoshan, Adi Margalit bat Ilka, Adi Shoham, Adan ben Orin, Benjamin ben Elizabeth, Bar Bar ben Julie, Bar Ben Neely, Bar Cooperstein, Julie, Cunio, Gavriel Batsara, Gay Ben Mirav, Gay Gaia Akov Ben Livna, Gili Ben Orna, Gal Ben Chen, Devir Ben Chadit, David Kroll Ben Garcia, Don Sessi Ben Shoshana, Dor Ben Iris, Dor ben Batia, Dor ben Vered, Dor ben Sharona, Doron ben Ephrat, Ilana, Doron ben Sara, Dorin ben Battali, Ditsa Hyman, Daniel ben Inga, Daniel bat Daniela, bat Ala, Daniel Shimon ben Sharon, Daniel bat Orli, Daphna bat Ma'ayan, Daphna bat Mayan again. Dor- Dror ben Ala, Hili bat Mar- Margaret, Hirsch ben Rachel, Vio- Vius- Vivian. Okay, Vivian, I gotta butcher that, sorry. Vivian bat Shoshana, Ziv ben Tamar, Chava bat Sali, Chen bat Shlomit, Tal ben Chen, Raz Asher, Tal bat Limor, Tal Shoham, Yigav ben Esther, Yahal bat Adi, Yahal Gani bat Adi, Yuval ben Hagar, Yuval bat Karina, Yuval Kim bat Miriam, Yuli bat Sharon, Yonat Or, Shoham bat Rachel, Yonatan ben Ayelet, Yonatan ben Miriam, Shinha bat Rachel, Shushan ben bat Rachel, Shoham 
בן פזית, שגב בן גלית, רון בן טלי, רחם בת מר, רחם בן תמר, רחל בת פולינה, רז בת דרון, רז בת אפרת, רותם בן אריאלה, רוני בן בירתה, רון בן סיגל, רון בן מעיין, רומי רוחמה בת שרה, רומי בת מירב, רוז בת דורון, רועי בן ניצה, קרן בת רותי, קרן בת לובה, קרן בת אסנת אסיה, שלי יצחק בן מירב, עופרי בת הגר, ענבר בת יפעת, עמית בת מרים, עמית בת דונה, עמית בן לימור, עמית אסתר, חיה בת אליאנה, עמירם קופר, עלמה בת יונת, עליאנה בת יוגניה, עינב בן פנינה, עידן בן תמר, עידן בן דלית, עידו בן כוכבה, עמרי בן רעיה, עמרי בן, בן חגית, עומר שם טוב, עומר בן, ש... בן שלי, עומר בן ניבה, עומר בן אסנת, עודד בן בלהה, עידן בת שירית, עידן בת עליזה, יונתן חי בן לינדה, יוסף בן אסתר, יורם בן, uh, בן מרים, יפתח בת, בן שושנה, יצחק בן ציפורה, ישי בן טליה, כפיר בן ש- שירי, כרמלה דן, כרמלה דן, לוטן בן, בן נעמי, ליאור בן מיכאל, ליאל בן, ליאל בן נרדית, שירי זילברמן בביאס, ביביאס, שקר בת בלה, שרון אביגדורי, אלוני קוניו, שרון בן לימור, שרון בת מתוקה, שרון בת רותי, תאיר בת עדנה, תומר בן סיגל, תמר בת יאירה, קרינה אריאב, and I don't know if I'm mispronouncing this. The last one here is Awat Suryasari. Okay, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing that. We're praying for all these hostages. Every single one of them is precious. Every single one of them is worth the entire world. And even though the magnitude of the tragedy is so big and the amount of pain and suffering is so vast, we can never forget about each individual. They have a family. They have friends. They have co-workers. They have a whole life, a whole world. And each one of them should be in our prayers. And we hope and we pray that all of them are saved. All of them are healthy. All of them are not going to be damaged from this. And please, God, they'll be rescued and they'll be brought to safety, back to their homes, back to their families. And we're going to dedicate our study today in their merit. We hope to only hear good news from our brethren in Israel May the Almighty watch over the soldiers. May the Almighty heal all the sick. May the Almighty comfort all the bereaved. And we're going to hopefully do our part to study, to pray, to invest in the spiritual dimension of the war as well as the physical and material and financial dimensions of it. May we only hear good news from, from Israel and from the rest of our brethren. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbeijima.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. Have a wonderful day, a splendid week, and a fantastic Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.